Uh, hey there. Uh, I'm Atticus McLaurin, and welcome to my talk, I Hate Pixel Art. Or, I was going to call it I Hate Pixel Art. I, I did give it a lot of thought, and I decided that the phrase I Hate Pixel Art could be interpreted as a little bit inflammatory. So, I went with something that is arguably more inflammatory, which is your next indie game doesn't need to be pixel art. Now, I need to talk this way, because if you've talked to me, if anybody has talked to me, there is a good chance that I have said, I hate pixel art. And I use the phrase, I hate pixel art, to express some really complicated emotions about the role of reductionism in art style. And I'm trying not to be so black and white, but I am, in general, a very hyperbolic person. But yeah, hopefully this talk will explain a lot of what I mean when I say I hate pixel art. But there is something I need to do to, to wipe the slate clean, because I don't hate pixel art. I, I really don't. As much as I say I hate pixel art, I don't hate pixel art at all. I really like some pixel art. I mean, the game Dead Cells. It's not strictly pixel art, it is 3D rendered to look like pixel art, but for all intents and purposes, it is pixel art. And I, I love the aesthetic behind it, It's uh, and I, I don't think it would be the same if it was not pixel art. Some of my favourite game art of all time is pixel art. Here is my magic 2, I think. the uh, it's, it's vibrant, it's readable. It's beautifully textured with such subtle granular granularity. I mean, oh, I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting a bit flushed just thinking about it. And there's some great, great pixel art coming up. I, I've seen people in the Australian game industry do some great pixel art, and I have nothing but admiration for it. So, all right, I say I hate pixel art, and who am I? Who am I to be saying what and what isn't good art? I feel like I do know a little bit what I'm talking about. I didn't want to do this. I wanted the talk to speak to itself, but apparently people said the biggest failing of this talk in practice was that I had no authority because no one knew that I could draw kind of well. So here's a small sample of my work. I'm Atticus. Uh, I'm a 2D artist and animator from Brisbane, and I like to make things pretty. And I've been kicking around the games industry for about eight years now, just making the game up, having a good time. Yeah. Alright, so why not pixel art? Imagine you're releasing an indie game. You've got beautiful, well, beautiful, bad, whatever, it's pixel art. It's, uh... But let's just say you're not the greatest artist, and you've decided to go with pixel art because you think that's easier. And you've got your art, you go onto Steam, and you start uploading your game, and then you realize that 70% of the games on the Steam new page are pixel art. Now you might be thinking, alright, this is just one time. I mean, well, it took me so long to do this talk that I did it again. Now, if you want to get eyeballs onto your game, one way of doing that is the art style. And if you're looking identical to 70% of the games on the Steam upload page, or the Steam new page, then you're not going to be able to differentiate yourself from the crowd. Okay, now there's another myth. Uh, I haven't, yeah, I've heard that pixel art is cheap in performance. And now transparency overdraw means that even alpha tests still cost performance. That's the uh, the stuff outside the pixel art. But you could have the difference between highly rendered sprites and pixel art sprites is nothing when it comes to transparency overdraw. Polygon nets, you aren't even really using pixel art at this stage. That's the polygon net that goes around the pixel art. SVG meshes are significantly more efficient than pixel art. Now that is a uh, Again, I won't be going into this because this isn't about a pixel art being cheap in performance. I'm just saying it's it's 2021, and if your game can't handle more than pixel art, you might need to evaluate evaluate why. And the bleeding edge technology for 1999 was 32 megabytes of RAM and 6 gigabytes of hard drive. 
Now, there are, there are arguments for why pixel art looks good. You might like the artifacting. You might like the textures that the artifacting gives your image. And that's fair. There are ways to add texture to work that isn't pixel art. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But this is the worst myth, and this is my motivation for doing this talk, is that I'm not skilled enough in art to do anything but pixel art. I've had people come up to me when I, I've said that I hate pixel art, and they've been like, but I can't do anything but pixel art because I, I suck at art. And that's not true. That's not true at all. And I want to explain to you why that's the case. But we're going to have to do a few deep dives for that. And for that, I want to introduce Pixel Doro and Pixel Duck, which are a couple of characters I made out of pixel art to try and explain some of the more complicated style explanations I'm, I'm going to go through in this talk. So the first thing I want to talk about is how art is about communication. Uh, it's the same reason that beautiful readable font is beautiful to us, and beautiful readable font in my atrocious handwriting is not. So it's interesting that the way pixel art sort of forms the same way that a font does. The pixel art grid is sort of acting in the same way that kerning, or those sticky bits of the letters are uh, the length of the sticky bits you've got you've got a limited space with which to put stuff and the pixel grid decides where you can and can't put things so if you have this smiley face here and you need to put a nose on there's only so much of a location you can put the nose because it's got this one pixel border around it you're like okay one location the nose can possibly go if you make the face even smaller there's no room for a nose, and you'd be like, well, I can't put a nose in. That's decided for you. You don't have to think about where to put the nose, or if there should or should not be a nose, because the pixel grid sort of is a guideline for you. It helps you do that. And in that way, pixel art is easier. Right? Right? <laughs> Alright, so before I get too ahead of myself, I want to talk about why readability is important. And that goes to our cave people days, when we would be scanning the horizons for predators or prey, or finding red berries in bushes. What we would do then is we would get a dopamine hit. And that's, that functions in, in the same way that a pixel art grid does, because the pixel art grid makes things easily readable for us, which means we're able to get a dopamine hit, or able to understand what's going on in the pixel art grid. We get a dopamine hit. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting stuff. And again, it's why this beautiful, readable font is so appealing to us, and again, why my atrocious handwriting is not. But what if I told you, what if I told you the limitation you pick doesn't need to be pixels? So here I've rendered out pixel doggo and pixel duck in triangles instead, or hexagons. There's both triangles and hexagons. They're quite similar. You can do a lot of really interesting things with triangles and hexagons. They function in basically the same way that a pixel grid does, except instead of a pixel grid, you've got a hexagonal grid divided into triangles. Now you might be like, okay, well that's all well and good, but how am I meant to do that with pixel-based programs? And there is a program called Mums at Hexels, which is fantastic because it's got this little isometric, isometric grid with which you can paint in uh, hexagonal triangles or anything you want, really. I promise you they're not paying me to say this. I just really, really like this program. You can do pixels or you can do triangles, hexagons, Veroni. You can even make and design your own grid, and the first thing that I did, of course, was make mine out of Bix, and that was just fantastic. It also allows you to do some really funky post-processing effects, which is, uh, gives a lot of uh, credence to the, ability, uh, to the to reasons of using it as a game art engine. Because what you'll find is uh, the, the workflow process to take things from Mums of Hexels into a game engine like Unity is, that Unity is actually really seamless. And yeah, you can do a whole bunch of funky stuff like this. 
I strongly recommend it as a program. It's real fun. So the, the myth that pixel art is easier to make look good. And if we go back to our K people times, what I'm, one of the big takeaways I want from this talk is that I want people to understand that readability gives us a dopamine hit. So when we have pixel art, it's divided into a grid which makes things easily readable. Doesn't matter what the grid is, it can be anything. So long as it's got that consistency, we're able to read it. So you might be thinking, all right, so what you're saying is you're just mad on hexels. Just change the pixel grid to a hexel grid and you'll be happy, right? And no, that's not entirely what I'm trying to say. I am saying that pixel art is overused and that using hexels could be an interesting way to differentiate yourself. But what I'm trying to say is you can do anything. Anything you say? Now, this looks a bit complicated, doesn't it? Well, all right, let's take it a step backwards. Let's do something a little bit less complicated than this, but a little bit more complicated than pixel art and hexel grids. What we've got here is an artist deciding that they're only going to use horizontal, diagonal, and vertical lines. And what that's led to is a really funky, unique style with which we can read stuff really easily again. And it's got that beautiful texture at the top, which is, and that's, that's another point. <laughs> and here's Pixel Doggo rendered in the horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines, of course, with a bit of texture at the top because I couldn't help myself. The biggest misconception is that artists agonize over every detail of their work. So when we come to this image, you'll actually notice that there are some consistent rules. You've got the background is desaturated and you'll find that contrast actually is dictating the distance. You've got detail be, uh, dictating whether or not something is natural or not. And you've got flat surfaces dictating whether something is inorganic. And that's a, a visual consistent style it's exactly the same thing that a pixel grid is doing, except just on a more advanced level. Let's take this work, for example. This uh, artist has decided that everything is going to be made up of circles and ovals. So when it comes to what shape am I going to draw the head? What shape am I going to draw the bun? The artist doesn't have to agonize over it because they've already decided in advance with a style guide what their artwork is going to look like. What shape am I going to draw the suitcase? It's They have round edges, it's already decided. I argue, and this really annoys me, that the map doesn't have rounded edges, but that, that's me nitpicking. What did this artist decide to do? All right, so they decided to do some internal lines here. There's no external lines, and there's a slightly darkened shadow around all the edges here. And there's also slight texturing around the outside edges. What has this artist decided to do? They've decided that light is going to be represented by line and shadow is going to be represented by line. Cast shadow, however, is going to be represented by a block. And the line work is very consistent throughout the entire work. So here's a little, I'm throwing it out to the audience, a bit of audience participation. And uh, this talk was designed to be in person. So perhaps instead of me getting an answer from the audience, you can spam chat if there is going to be a chat about what style you think the artist decided to render the clouds surrounding Fuji in. Now I'll give you some time. All right, you giving it some thought? Alright, if you said this style, this kind of geometric, blocky, polygonal style, then you're correct. And I'm going to hazard a guess that most of you are correct in this. And how did we know that was the case? Because we informed the decision from the rest of the artwork, and that's exactly what the artist did. The artist didn't need to agonize about what style these clouds were going to be in. All they needed to do was realize they were rendered in the same style they had already established. Alright, 
So that's one thing, but how do I decide rules that look good? And now this is the really interesting thing. Because readability gives us a dopamine hit, readability is actually what causes readability is what causes the dopamine hit. Now, the magic formula is that consistent rules lead to readability, and that leads to appeal, or a dopamine hit. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so what, what I did is I got some friends of mine to give me some basic rules that I was going to use to draw some pictures to. They had no idea what these pictures were going to look like after. And this is the first set of rules. Rules. No straight lines. Lines one step darker than color. Overlapping forms and in swirls, except mouths. And no closed shapes. And so what I did, with absolutely no effort on my part, no agonizing, no thinking, I just shat these out. Now, what that is, is that's a really funky, unique style. And you can, you can see the appeal on that immediately. You can see that this could be a, a nice little style for a little indie game. Okay. And then I got another friend to give me some similar rules. And these rules were straight lines, corners rounded, forms have borders. Anything that's a square should be a rectangle instead. And then I came up with these two little funky characters. Again, I say came up with. I, I didn't do any work for these at all. But still, you can imagine this style being like in a little indie game. And what I'm trying to say, just nail that point home, consistent rules equal readability equals visual appeal. If something has consistent rules, it is readable by its very nature. And thanks to the dopamine hits we get from our time as cave people, that leads to a dopamine hit and visual appeal. Here's another example of that happening in action. So we take this image, right? And the first thing we do is we start to read the image from the top left corner because of the westerns. Now our lizard brain says, this is flat. This is flat color all the way through. There, there is no gra granular gradient highlights or shading or anything like that. Okay. We keep on going throughout the image. And we come to, this uses black as a deep shadow. And we're like, okay, okay, okay. And then we come to this one, shadows are inverted bulbously. So as we're going through this whole image, we're starting to understand what the language this artist is telling us is. And by the time we get down to here, we intimately understand how this artist is describing cacti and what they look like and how they're read. And that gives us a beautiful dopamine hit. And that's what it's appealing about this image. It is about developing a language. And you can use anything to develop that language. Now, I've talked a lot about rendering styles here, but I haven't talked much about form. Now, the two are kind of closely interrelated. You'll remember the uh, Pixel Duggo and Pixel Duck. I had the uh, squares would only be rectangles style. Now, that is an example of a form uh, differentiation. Now, Craig McCracken is a master at this. You can see how he's developed this established language and how each character has a really... It's consistent. It's got, it's got its own... Every character has its own silhouette. But it, it's got these consistent arcs, which, as we read the image, allow us to intimately understand how these characters are formed. Same thing happens with the style of the Powerpuff Girls. Everything are these bulbous circles. So I want to do a little bit of an exploration about the way we approach Flint and Heroes. Uh, that, was, that was one of the games I worked on. I spent a lot of time and I had a lot of fun developing the look and feel of this game. So one of the first things we knew we wanted is we knew we wanted things to be bright, colorful, and detailed and textured. So I sort of started to experiment with this sort of yarn style here. And things were a little bit off color. And yeah, I thought this was, this was kind of fun. Now, what you'll notice here is the consistency that things have. 
you'll notice that there are these lines everywhere. Oh. These lines everywhere, and these little extra details everywhere and on everything, and that ties the whole thing together. There's like odd colors, like this bird has uh, a weird green and blue. It's, it's very not real colors. Now when it came to the form, what I did here was I had a couple of rules that I wanted to experiment with. I wanted the shape to be distinct when going on an arc from here to here. And I, most birds have no feet, but unfortunately parrots, our, our uh, main character here, had to have feet because parrots have such big feet, I, I just couldn't, couldn't ignore them. Now what I've got here, the, these Ds, 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 this is me establishing a consistent language for the proportions that each bird would have. So if we go back here, we'll notice that every character has a huge head. It also has a relatively large chest and then a relatively large tail. And that's, that's, that's the language I'm trying to establish with these circles here. And so we kept on at it. I tried to uh, distill some parrot anatomy into a very simplistic form. So you can see I'm trying to take the neck of this bird here and really fit it in there. I've got this distinct shape going. I, I've got a few little visual markers here, so a little tuft of hair in the back, which this, this guy doesn't have, but you know, we, we, we thought it was really important to have something there. So this arc here, and then you've got the shapes, uh, the, the size of all the different areas of the body, which are consistent between all characters, which leads to a readable language with which people can view those characters in. But there was something missing. And that was when we realized that the rendering style was very boring. So what we did is we took the polygon level and we made the, the quality like one. And then it came up with this beautiful, funky, little naive, wobbly style. And we thought like, that's, that's definitely it. That's the unique style we're going with. Now, everything has this faceted rendering style which again makes everything easy to read because it's all together in the same same way like that. They have the same body shapes, huge eyes, and you're able to read everything and every character in this image. Here's another game that I think did this significantly better than I did. Uh, I think it's some of the best game mod I've ever seen in my life. It's uh, Non Non Galaxy for anybody in the audience that's played this game. They've got this beautiful faceted uh, vector it's vectors, which is again runs this performance runs so smoothly, and it's got these little textures over the top. It's uh, decided that the lines are going to be the same color as the the forms, and like yeah, these beautiful hexagonal faceted look. Now the last part of this talk. Because we're game artists, what I want to talk is how to apply. Uh, what I want to talk about is how to apply this theory to making different elements of the game readable. So, instead of making everything in the illustration, of, uh, instead of making everything in this screenshot be the same visual style, what the artist has done has made elements that have different meanings have a different visual style. So what you'll see here is that everything the player can interact with is this gorgeous hexagonal faceted look. But what, and you see this little guy over here, he's a hexagonal faceted character because that's interactable. And then what we'll see is you have these little food bubbles here, these ingredient bubbles. And because those are really important to be differentiated from the background, they've got their own unique visual style. This terrain here, that's got its own unique visual style. You'll see here that it's got these little, um, sorry, someone's trying to give me a phone call. Uh, you'll see it's got these beautiful little hatched edges, and that dictates destructible terrain. And then you've got the background, which is its own unique layer, so people can differentiate that from the gameplay layer. And then you've got the UI, which has, even again, its own unique style.
it's got these deep black outlines and it's got flat color it's, it's bold it, it's not delicate like the rest of the image on the inside and that's what ties that's what ties everything in this screenshot together the delicateness of it but it does have its own unique style for every different element and yeah it's just it's an easy replicable style and one that I think is very appealing. And here's another game that does it well, I think. The Swords of Ditto Momo's Curse. It doesn't quite have the same level of differentiation between different elements and different layers of gameplay, but it does have a unique visual style, which allows you to, again, as you read the image, you go from the top, you, you start to understand how they've done these little whiny shady bits. Okay, they've got dark shadows here. By the time you get to the end of the image, you understand. You understand how to read this image innately. But a game that I think does really well is Don't Starve Together. Now they've got a really, really unique scratchy style here. And one of the things they've done is they've made all things in the gameplay layer have this beautiful scratchy style. And then made the background, because that's not part of the interactable layers they've given it this flat textured very uh messy kind of look but it's, it's very uh gradienty so you don't get confused between the two layers and then you've got again the ui on the top being its own different style so you can differentiate that yet again all right so we've been through quite a bit in this talk and there are a couple of takeaways I really am hoping that I manage to get across. Art being readable is what makes it appealing. You don't... You don't need to... You, you can make any rule, so long as it's consistent, it'll be readable. And artists don't agonize over every corner of their work. Style guides take the hard work out of deciding what their art should contain. And I really hope that you're able to approach style from the idea that uh, consistent rules and limitations do make things easier and you should use them because not only do they make things easier they make things more appealing by their very nature so it comes back to beautiful readable font and why that's beautiful and why this is not but instead of doing this beautiful readable font why not do this beautiful readable font or this beautiful readable font, or even this beautiful readable font. And that's my talk. That's all I have to say. I really hope that I was able to communicate this effectively because I think it's a really important thing for people who think they're bad at art to understand that art is a very science-based process and you don't need to agonize and you, you don't need to be confused because it really is as simple as consistency equals readability equals visual appeal. Thank you.